In the field of eschatology, we look at some big ticket items. The now and the not yet, kingdom of God, Jesus' second coming, millennium and tribulation, the final judgment. But before we get to things like heaven, hell, and the new creation, we have to look at individual eschatology, the state and the fate of the individual person in the post-mortem future. Here we investigate something usually called the intermediate state that the believer experiences upon death, but before the final resurrection. The subject of the intermediate state is important for several reasons. First, I mean, we all have to wrestle with our own mortality. I mean, I know I may look 21, but I am now, in fact, can you believe, 44 years of age, and I've reached the point where naive feelings of invincibility and immortality associated with youth are beginning to recede quicker than my hairline. My, my strawberry and cream-colored hair is beginning to show more cream than strawberry these days. Uh, death approaches me and you. What will become of me? What will happen to you? That's, that's why it's relevant. Second, we must consider how to minister to the dying and the bereaved. When someone asks, uh, what is going to happen to me or what happened to my mom, my dad, my son, my wife, uh, what do we say? What do we say happens to the fate of the individual beyond death? What hope do we offer them and what details does the Bible give us for a life beyond the grave? Thankfully, Scripture has something to say to these issues. So tackling this topic reminds us that the gospel holds out the promise of eternal life because it brings news of God's victory over death. The Christian testimony to the gospel is one of hope for those who die in the Lord. For where the Lord is, there we shall be also. There are a number of options for what, where, and when the intermediate state takes place. And we'll give a, a quick survey of those now. One position is called soul sleep or psychopanicky, which is the doctrine that the soul is unconscious between death and resurrection. Uh, this position has popped up throughout church history, and it's sometimes been a bit of a minority view. Uh, Martin Luther is said to have hold to it, as did some of the Anabaptists and some of the Socinians. More recently, it's held by Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses. Those who hold to a monistic understanding of human constitution also adhere to this view, because they insist that human existence requires a bodily mode, and if we do not have a bodily state, we cannot, in fact, exist. Uh, personally, I can see the attraction to this as someone who has struggled with insomnia pretty much my whole life. The prospect of one big nap before resurrection is kind of attractive. However, we have indications, especially from persons present at Jesus' transfiguration and the portrayal of the martyrs in the book of Revelation, that there is a conscious life beyond the immediate corridors of death. A second option is purgatory. In the Roman Catholic tradition, the holy saints at death are directly transported to heaven, while lesser souls like us must experience the cleansing of purgatory before entering the blessed state. According to the Catholic Catechism, the, the official doctrine of the Catholic Church, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. As such, it says, the church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. Uh, Thomas Aquinas taught that if purity cannot be attained by works of satisfaction in this life, it is necessary to posit purgatory or a place of cleansing for this to occur. Uh, in response to purgatory, I would argue that there is no evidence in the Old or New Testament that there is an intermediate state which is a place of cleansing, somewhere where you can work off your sins with good behavior. Uh, it is undoubtedly true that human beings need to be cleansed from their sin. However, cleansing and purification are one of the achievements of the cross and received by faith. Uh, the, the author of Hebrews uh, taught that Jesus' death is better than the Old Testament sacrifices because, the author says, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit 
offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. The good news is that Jesus makes us clean, as clean as we need to be. There's nothing left for Jesus to cleanse in purgatory. Jesus has washed all of our sins away. And in terms of the biblical witness, the place of the dead is described with two main words in Scripture. Sheol, the Old Testament, and Hades in the New Testament. Uh, A number of Lucan texts provide information about a possible intermediate state. The most controversial is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Uh, The key thing to remember about that passage is that it's something of of a fictional narrative designed to reinforce the warning about the dangers of the love of money. It's the ancient equivalent of little stories about St. Peter's Gate or the the pearly white gates, uh, where the meaning is more moral than literal. So although the parable refers to an intermediate state, uh, personal eschatology is not the main point of it. It's primarily about wealth and riches. Also in the Gospel of Luke, there's a curious remark uttered by Jesus on the cross when one of the bandits uh, crucified with Jesus asks him, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies with the promise, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, that saying is problematic because the other two appearances of the word paradisos in the New Testament both refer to heaven. Now, is Jesus saying here that he went directly to heaven after death? Well, I don't think that's possible because the risen Jesus told Mary, you know, says, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. You know, go instead and tell my brothers uh, that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, that type of a thing. So Jesus had not been to heaven yet. So if Jesus was not in heaven, where did he go? What is this paradise he promised the, the, the bandit, the other thief? Most likely, paradise here denotes the intermediate state, and it's another way of referring to Hades, and especially the good part of Hades. Uh, This comports with the biblical teaching that when Jesus died, he went to the waiting place of the dead. Uh, The Greek word paradisos was a Persian loan word that denoted an enclosed park surrounded by a wall. It was also used to describe the future state so that the future city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, will be like a garden of Eden, only better. In subsequent Jewish thought, paradise also referred to the present abode of departed patriarchs, the elect and the righteous. Paradise here is an intermediate state that is neither heaven nor hell. It's the waiting place of the dead, the blissful location of uh, saints within Sheol or Hades. Shifting to Luke's second volume, the Acts of the Apostles, Stephen was stoned for his testimony to Jesus' exaltation at the right hand of God. As he was bludgeoned with stone, Stephen exclaimed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, this mirrors the words of Jesus himself at his crucifixion, you know, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is Christologically significant that while the Lucan Jesus prays to the Father to receive his spirit at his crucifixion, Stephen prays that Jesus would receive him beyond his martyrdom. What Luke presents to his readers seems to be a belief in an intermediate state located in Hades before the resurrection and then an intermediate state located in heaven after Jesus' resurrection. So there is a kind of transition going on here. Formerly, believers, when they passed away, went to Hades, uh, the the waiting place of the dead. But ever since Jesus' ascension, now when the faithful die, they go directly to heaven to be with their Lord. So beyond that, I think we can also gain some clarity from what the Apostle Paul says about the intermediate state. Paul writes to the Philippians about his, you know, the prospect of his own execution. He says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I, I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Here, note how Paul contrasts living in the body with departing to be with Christ, which he says is better by far. 
Paul provides no data or no information about the nature of this intermediate state, where it takes place or what form he exists in there, we can only assume that death entails a removal from his body and a transportation to instant intimacy with the Savior. Uh, we learn even more from 2 Corinthians 5, and though this is a somewhat uh, ambiguous passage in many respects, yet Paul still seems to envisage a post-mortem time uh, where he's away from the body, where we are yet, he says, unclothed, yet at home with the Lord. And, and, and while there, we're still waiting an eternal house in heaven. Paul seems to envisage uh, upon death uh, not a spiritual resurrection, but a future spiritual mode of existence that is transcendent, yet not fully actualized until the parousia. Paul hopes to please the Lord both in his bodily state and again in his heavenly state, knowing that he will stand before Christ at the final judgment. The book of Revelation uh, focuses attention on the events leading up to the final state, a new heavens and a new earth. Still, John makes some comment about a possible intermediate state for believers uh, after death yet before the general resurrection. When John refers to the state of martyrs, it's, a, it's clear that they exist in a heavenly dimension that is once both blissful, busy, and yet not entirely satisfying. In Revelation 6, the martyrs cry out for vindication and they look forward to the judgment and wrath that are set to come upon those who mistreated them and murdered them. Some people in heaven are in fact complaining that this has not happened yet. In Revelation 7, the martyrs enter into the presence of the throne room of heaven and even engage in heavenly worship and enjoy heavenly peace and they are shepherded by the Lamb who comforts them. This penultimate stage depicts departed saints as being in the presence of God in heaven. And as we've seen, some are complaining, some are worshipping. And then there's another thing to note from Revelation as well, is the relationship between Hades and hell. In Revelation, um, Hades is closely related to death, and it stands as the waiting place of the dead rather than the final place of the condemned. Though the Greek word for hell, Gehenna, does not occur in Revelation, there is a mention of a lake of burning fire or sulfur that amounts pretty much to the same thing, to, to, to hell, Gehenna. Uh, note that there is a point in Revelation where John describes how death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire, we're told, is the second death. That is to say, Hades gets thrown into hell. That would mean, uh, if we take the language seriously, that no one is in hell yet. The contents of Hades will be dumped into hell at the final judgment, which means now there is no one populating hell. So, if we step back for a minute, in light of what we've seen from the gospel, from Paul, from Revelation, we could map out the intermediate state this way. Prior to Christ's ascension, all who died descended to Sheol or Hades, which was divided into two parts, one for the wicked and one for the righteous. Then at Christ's ascension, he went into heaven and he took with him all the saints in the paradisal part of Sheol, Hades. I think this is implied by Ephesians 4, while the wicked then remain in Sheol, Hades, waiting for judgment. Upon death, uh, new covenant believers go to be with Christ in heaven ahead of the general resurrection, while the wicked go to Hades waiting for judgment. Eventually, Hades will be thrown into hell and all believers will share in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, coming to a close, um, in the uh, movie Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, uh, there is a point where the Grim Reaper makes a very profound statement. He said, you can be a king or a street sweeper, but sooner or later you dance with the Reaper. Death, like taxes, is unavoidable. Uh, in Hebrews, we read that people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Uh, there's a whole industry related to death in our society, including its, its prevention, its preparation, uh, posthumous care for the bereaved. There's even a peer-reviewed journal called Death Studies. 
death has fascinated people from Homer to Shakespeare, and uh, today we can find it portrayed in literature, art, music, and drama. So death is big, big business. It's a big de deal. It's artistically captivating, philosophically fascinating, and existentially haunting. But it is real. It's universal. It's inevitable. Yet Jesus taught that death is not the end. He also proved it by his resurrection. And he promised us that something better lies in store. When we die in the Lord, ahead of the resurrection, we still have an intermediate state where we are with the Lord. No text, except perhaps 2 Corinthians 5, discourses on it at length, but overall it seems that the New Testament consistently represents fellowship with Christ after death as the distinctively Christian view of the intermediate state. Paul is clear that one departs to be with Christ, and according to John the Evangelist, where Christ is, their believers shall also be. For nothing, not even death, demons can separate believers from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The intermediate state brings fellowship with Christ, and in him we also find the continued fellowship of believers ahead of the final consummation. Death does not eradicate the believer's union with Christ or their communion with fellow believers. Whatever life is ahead in the eschatological future, interim or final, there is still life in Christ.